So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www. PIDS.gov.ph and click the SERP widget or type SERP P.PIDS.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. 
Dito pumapasok ang tungkulin na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So, what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars And the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policy makers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is e easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.com pids.gov.ph and click the SERP widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. 
Pag nangulit tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at pulisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga pulisiya at programa ng pamahalaan Bago pa man ito ipatupad, dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, masipet, lib! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to the PIDS webinar series. We trust that all of you are safe and in good health. I'm Sheila CR and I will be your moderator. Friends, we will tackle two very important public health issues this afternoon. First is the government's expanded program on immunization, this long-standing problems of low vaccination coverage and untimely immunization. The other topic that we will cover today is the rising cases of non-communicable diseases and how our private and how our primary health care system is coping to address 
uh, the situation. I now give the floor to uh, the president of PIDS, Dr. Celia Reyes, to officially open our virtual event. Ma'am Cel? Sheila, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, I can me? hear you. Yes. Okay, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Senator Pia Cayetano, Senate Economic Planning Office Director General Ronald Golding and Director Sir Cesne Tafan, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department Director General Romulo Emanuel Miral Jr. and Executive Director Novel Bangsal, NEDA Director Gurley Grace Casimiro Igtiben and Director Joseph Lalo, National Council on Disability Affairs Executive Director Emerito Rojas, Social Security System Corporate Executive Officer Norminda Santos, University of the Philippines System Vice President for Academic Affairs and PIDS Board Member Dr. Cynthia Bautista. We also have um, Natividad Pangasinan Counselor Carlos Zaragoza. And from the private sector, we have United Laboratories Senior Vice President Jose, Marie, Jose Maria Ochave, Ascend Vice President Jeffrey Gatbula, Computrate Technology Philippines Director Teddy Sumulong. And from the academe, we have Cagayan State University President Urduha Alvarado, Southern Luzon State University Vice President for Administrative and Financial Affairs Frederick Villa, Nueva Vizcaya State University Vice President for Academic Affairs Jocelyn Cabrera, Siliman University Director of the Office of Community Engagement and Service Learning and General Physician Lourdes Ursos. And from the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, we have Director and Head of Academic Programs Rufo Bueza, Director of Research Institute for Human and Social Development, Nicolas Maliari, and Dean Walhati de la Cruz. We also have University of the Philippines Manila School of Health Sciences, Dean Filedito Tandinko, St. Paul University Philippines, Dean Anunciacion Talosig, and um, also Benguet State University, um, Dean Vicente Panagan Jr. and Mariano Marcos State University, Dean Ricardo Sotelo Guanzon. Um, we would also like to welcome UNICEF Philippines Chief of Health and Nutrition, Dr. Malalay Amadzai, World Bank Philippines Senior Human Development Specialist, Mr. Sutayot Osorn Braso, Save the Children Philippines Director for Thematic Program, Cecilia Francisco, Philippine Society of Nutritionist Dietitians President Natalie Pulvinar, Center for Policy Studies and Advocacy on Sustainable Development Executive Director Maria Fatima Villena, and Philippine NGO Council on Population, Health and Welfare Executive Director Eden Divina Gracia. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our last webinar for this month. Our current public health crisis proves the importance of having an efficient, affordable, and effective healthcare system. One aspect of this is to be able to alleviate the emergence of diseases that are already preventable, which can be done by ramping up our immunization program. Since 1976, the Philippines, through the Department of Health or DOH, has been implementing its expanded program on immunization or EPI to promote universal access to effective and safe vaccines for common vaccine preventable diseases such as diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, and measles. Indeed, the program has saved many Filipino children from disabilities and premature deaths caused by these diseases. However, according to one of the studies to be presented this afternoon, the EPI struggles to maintain its immunization coverage at par with global recommendations for herd immunity. It's also facing challenges in reaching its target to fully immunize um, at least 95% of all children, a target stated in the DOH National Objectives for Health 2017 to 2022. In the last 30 years, the coverage of basic vaccines remained at 70 to 80%. Similarly, an earlier PIDS study noted that only 10% of Filipino children were able to receive complete and timely vaccination. According to this study, immunizing too early or too late 
decreases the ability of the vaccines to prevent targeted diseases. It also pointed out that untimely vaccination has been the cause of infectious disease outbreaks in several countries, despite having a high immunization coverage. For instance, China, Israel, and Russia have a vaccine coverage of more than 95%, but have experienced measles outbreaks among their young children due to untimely immunization. This afternoon, authors Dr. Valerie Gilbert Ulep and Ms. Jana Oy, research fellow and supervising research specialist at PIDS respectively, will share with us their study titled An Assessment of the Expanded Program on Immunization in the Philippines, Challenges and Ways Forward. The paper evaluated the EPI in terms of coverage, timeliness, and equity of administration. It also probed into the implementation of the program by identifying supply side challenges that could have hindered the achievement of national immunization targets. Another topic that we will be looking at is managing the non-communicable diseases or NCDs in the country. The PIDS study titled Primary Health Care for Non-Communicable Diseases in the Philippines noted that NCDs are now the leading causes of disease burden in the Philippines. It also said that in 2019, these diseases accounted for 70% of the total 600,000 deaths in the country. Aside from the negative impacts of these diseases to the population's health, it also affects the country's economy. According to a DOH article, NCDs would cost the national economy an estimated 70, 756.5 billion pesos per year, or equivalent to 4.8% of the country's annual gross domestic product. Moreover, NCDs, which include cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, and diabetes, have long duration and slow progression. With expensive treatment for these diseases, the poor and near poor become more vulnerable to poverty. This is especially true for those who are living in countries like the Philippines, where a major source of health spending for many is out of pocket. According to, to the World Health Organization, one way to combat NCDs is by establishing a robust primary health care system, which provides access to early management of the diseases through first contact, as well as continuous and integrated health care services. Later, the same authors will also be sharing with us the results of the study, which assess the readiness of the country's primary health care system in managing NCDs. It also identified specific challenges in governance, financing, service delivery, and health human resources that hinder the realization of a comprehensive and continuous delivery of NCD services in local communities. To give us more insights on the ground, we invited representatives from the DOH and the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. I would like to thank Dr. Maria Rosario Silvia Uy, lead of the Non-Communicable Disease Subgroup of TOH Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, Dr. Kim Patrick Tejano, National Immunization Program Manager and Medical Officer at, again, the Disease Prevention and Control Bureau of TOH, and Ms. Ana Lisa De Leon, a Senior of Social Insurance Specialist under the Quality Assurance Group of the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, for taking their time to be with us this afternoon. I look forward to hearing your thoughts about the findings of the studies that will be presented today. Again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Have a good day. Thank you very much, uh, Ma'am Sel. So as um, mentioned by, by uh, Ma'am Sel, two PIDS studies will be uh, presented today and flashed on the screen are the authors. Dr. Valerie uh, Gilbert Ulep, Ms. Chana Wood, assisted by um, uh, Mr. Lil Daryl um, Casas. Okay. To present the paper evaluating the government's immunization program is uh, Ms. Jana Oy. Uh, she's a supervising research specialist at PIDS. Uh, Ms. Oy has a master's in epidemiology from the Harvard School of Public Health and a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences from the Ateneo de Manila University. She serves as an applied epidemiologist, working in partnership with um, health sector decision makers in the conduct of policy research for health system reform and universal health care. I now give the floor to Jana for her presentation. Jana, over to you. Hello, uh, let me just share my screen. Thank you for that, um, Mom Sheila. Sure. 
Sorry. Uh, Hi, Jana. You can uh, change it in the display settings at the yeah. upper part of your screen. Oh, here. Got it. Thank you. Swap. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this public seminar today. So let's begin with the presentation of our assessment of the DOH EPI. Right. So here's the framework of the study and the contents of the presentation. First, we will start with an overview of the end goal of any immunization program, which is to decrease the burden of vaccine preventable diseases, especially in children. Then we will look into the intermediate outcomes of immunization coverage and the timeliness of immunization that influence this burden, uh, as well as the equity of uh, performance subnationally in the country. Last, we will look into possible supply and demand side reasons for uh, our intermediate outcomes and also give some recommendations for the EPN. Okay, so to review the, D the DOH expanded program of immunization was established in 1976 through a presidential decree and reinforced in 2011 by another Republic Act. So the goal is really to provide children with access to life saving vaccines and reduce uh, the burden of disease for select diseases. So at its core on the right table, you will see there are six basic vaccines and they cover around eight common diseases. So like TB, hepatitis B, polio, um, tetanus, and measles, right? So there is no question that the morbidity and mortality due to vaccine preventable diseases, such as measles, mumps, and polio, has declined significantly, significantly after the introduction of the EPI in 1976. Um, the DOH EPI has actually done a remarkable job sustaining the gains uh, since 1990s, where the VPV burden really declined sharply. However, our current situation on the right side of the slide is that we see occasional outbreaks. The most uh, alarming and uh, publicized would be the measles outbreaks in 2014, 2018, and 2019. And also the two cases of polio in 2019 after we were declared polio free in 2000. These occasional outbreaks reflect long-standing problems of low vaccination coverage and untimely administration of vaccines um, that really lead to a failure to reach and maintain herd immunity levels. Okay, so we'll go to the intermediate outcomes. So this graph shows how immunization coverage for the proportion of children vaccinated in the past three decades has really been unstable. We were, we were doing quite well in the 2000s, 2012 to 2012. For all basic vaccines, for some vaccines, we actually reached the 95% coverage for BCG and the first doses of DPT and polio. Um, then around 2013, 2014, coverage suddenly declined for all the vaccines. And in 2016, only 70% of all children completed all their vaccines, their basic vaccines. Um, since the 1990s, we have never reached um, the 95% coverage for all the vaccines. We have for individual vaccines, but not for the basic set. Okay. So comparing Philippine immunization coverage in the red line in this graph compared to the global average in black and to other countries in the other shades, when EPI started in the 1980s, Philippine immunization coverage was more than twice that of the global average. Um, but over time, uh, we struggled to maintain the gains made in the 1990s, while countries like Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, and Laos, um, they su successfully increased their coverage and maintained it. Okay? In, in contrast to the present, um, most ASEAN countries have indeed uh, maintained their coverage. And currently, in 2017 and 2018, the Philippine immunization coverage has is the lowest in the ASEAN region are among our ASEAN neighbors, and they are even lower uh, compared to some of the poorest countries in Sub-Saharan Africa listed here in the bottom of the slide. Look at, looking at equity of the coverage across our regions, uh, we see that immunization coverage um, was also characterized by large fluctuations similar to the national trend. There was also a consistent decline in 2013 similar to national declines. Um, and the decline is especially alarming in three regions, namely region six on the top slide here, Western Visayas, um, region 12, lower left, and ARMM. 
In the ARMM, we never had reached a basic vaccination coverage more than 50%. So that is a particularly um, alarming region. Yeah, in this, uh, it is this fluctuation of coverage that really enables uh, the disease outbreak. So on this graph on the right, you will see the red line represents measles cases and the yellow line's basic vaccine coverage. Okay, the measles outbreak in 2017, the spike in the red line um, can be attributed to the large to the declines in coverage in the prior year. So there was already a downward trend from 2010 to 2013 for. Uh, vaccination coverage, and that precipitated in the spike of measles cases in 2014, which we consider an outbreak. Aside from coverage, timeliness of immunization is increasingly gaining importance as a global metric for EPI performance. So what does timeliness mean? Timeliness means that children get their vaccines according to their immunization schedule or in a certain recommended age range. For example, children should receive their first dose of polio vaccine between six to eight weeks after birth. Okay. The timeliness of immunization is necessary for optimal immune response, and literature has documented outbreaks in other countries despite high coverage. So based on our numbers from the 2017 Demographic Health Survey, depending on the vaccine, you will see on the left, um, around 40 to 50 percent, only around 40 to 50 percent of children get their vaccines in the, within the recommended age ranges or times. So, um, overall, even if we say have a 70% basic vaccination coverage, 70% uh, of our children get all their vaccines um, at some point in time, only 7% of those children um, get them within the recommended age range, according to our analysis. So the median delay uh, per antigen or per vaccine range from 20 to 60 days on the bottom of the slide. Um, the delays are particularly greater among doses in a series, like the third dose of PDPT or polio. Um, in terms of equity of coverage and time, yes, in among socioeconomic classes, there is a clear socioeconomic gradient. What does this mean? This means that the immunization coverage and timeliness um, are higher in richer socioeconomic classes and lower for the um, bottom 60% or bottom 20% of the population. So you can see that by comparing the blue bars and the or, or lines and the orange bars for lines. So to try to explain the trends in immunization coverage and timeliness, we looked into the EPI inputs at the national level. While the fund factors like vaccine confidence have contributed to declines, um, the, the trend is really due to recurring supply system challenges in the DOH. Okay. So first, looking at the demand side of vaccine confidence, the graph on the screen shows the uh, coverage for DP3, DPT3, a tracer indicator. This is the last vaccine in the series for children before measles. So the coverage is represented in the blue line, uh, and that's the proportion. Uh, the, okay, and the orange bars represent public perception of how safe vaccines are. Okay. So we mark the occurrence of Dengvaksha, the Dengvaksha controversy by the red dotted red line in 2017. Okay. The graph shows that coverage was low in 2014, even before, uh, even before the Dengvaksha um, issue. Okay. It recovered a bit in 2016 um, and then declined again in post Dengvaksha. Um, but overall, the vaccine coverage, vaccine confidence seems to be improving over time. Um, so this is why we, we believe that vaccine confidence contributes, but does not entirely explain the fluctuations in coverage in the past decades. Rather, the supply side issues that remained during this period really contributed to uh, the performance. Okay, so for the supply side, let's start with national stock. National stockouts have been common in the past decade. So the table on top table uh, shows that the shows the duration of stockouts at national storage, that is the RITM, per vaccine. Okay, in 2013 to 2015, there were persistent stockouts in the pentavalent vaccine. The pentavalent vaccine covers five vaccine preventable diseases. Okay, the stockouts reached nine months in 2013 and 2015, and later we will see that it's because of failed local buildings. In more recent years at the bottom table, 
2016 to 2019, the bottom table shows whether we have excess or deficits at the national warehouses. So we really have difficulty maintaining stocks or and also buffer stocks for vaccines like polio, pentavalent, uh, measles, and hepatitis B, right? Going through procurement, in recent years, the DOH has been attempting to procure vaccines directly from local manufacturers, which typically undergo a competitive procurement process. Local procurement is part of the country's long-term effort towards vaccine independence. Okay, so, but it is, uh, has been contributing to national stock outs. Um, the table on the right shows the procurement um, results of the EPI from 2013 to 2019. The number of bid failures are enclosed in parentheses. Okay. Negotiated procurement, uh, particularly with UNICEF, UNICEF, was prominent in the years 2013, 2014, 2017, and 2018. Local bidding was done in 2015, 2016, and recently in 2019. Okay. So what happens is when local tenders fail, the government re resorts to emergency procurement with UNICEF later in the year when stockouts are occurring. So the trend in local bidding failures for basic vaccines, uh, you can see in the re uh, red highlighted cell. Um, there were really a lot of bid failures in 2015. And so we shifted to UN procurement in the next years and then tried again in 2017. So a closer look for the bid failures. Um, so 2015 was a particularly bad year for local procurement. Um, there, we can see that this is the, the failed biddings were in BCG, pentavalent, and measles, uh, which explains the previous slide of having nine months of stock outs for certain vaccines. And, and when we now actually try to procure, um, procurement typically follows a one-year procurement period. Okay, the figure shows the detailed steps in vaccine procurement and the times it takes for each step. Okay, uh, we can pay attention to the boxes highlighted in red. Okay, so more than half of all awarded bids for the EPI vaccines take more than 106 days. Um, and the bottlenecks are really those in the red boxes. So they occur um, in the post qualification notice of award and the contract sign. So that takes around half um, the total time for the procurement. Um, once we get the vaccines, um, now we have to store them in our national warehouses. So in terms of national storage and distribution, DOH has limited capacity to accommodate the vaccine supplies. Um, it has no room for additional physical expansion with the RITM. Uh, RITM can only accommodate around three months supply of all these basic vaccines. Um, so that means it cannot, uh, uh, it means that their delivery of vaccines to lower levels to the uh, local governments, provinces, must be that done in four tranches yearly. Um, and ideally you would stock three to six months of buffer stock, uh, but it's not, that is not possible with the limited space. Um, so when, now when they distribute it to the LGUs, there's really a lack of an organized system. Um, DOH hires third party logistics companies, but they also have difficulty for filling the quarterly deliveries, not just of the vaccines, but also other DOH supplies. Um, there are also some issues with delayed payments for the logistics companies, which cause delays because they pause deliveries. Um, and lastly, there is really no electronic monitoring system to inventory vaccines and supplies. Um, knowledge of stock and where stock goes ends at the regional level. In terms of budget allocation, the EPI is clearly a priority program of the Department of Health. Um, you can see on the graph how, but how much budget has changed over time, over the years. So, uh, it, it, it received significant funds from the sin taxes, particularly in 2012. Okay, so pre-2010, you can see that budget was less than 1 billion pesos. Um, but in 2020, uh, now we have 7.3 billion for the EPI. That's around 7.2% of DOH's 100 billion budget. Um, and that represents around a fourfold increase from 2013 to the present time. However, if you look closely at the EPI's budget, um, there is a lack of priority for systems building and ensuring basic vaccination or support for basic vaccination is strong at the primary healthcare level. 
Okay, on the right um, is a breakdown of where the budget has been spent for 2017 and 2018. So you can see that cent taxes were used to uh, more or less buy additional vaccines to include in the program, such as rotavirus, human papillomavirus, and Japanese encephalitis. Particularly, PCV or the new uh, pneumococcal vaccine takes around 60% of the EPI's budget. Um, so in essence, EPI continues to expand vaccines, including more and more vaccines past the basic set without commensurate increases in, say, staffing at the national level, uh, regional levels, LGU levels, um, no increases or investments in cold chain capacity, LGU capacity to store and deliver at point of care, their DOH capacity to monitor, and also service delivery channels. Okay. And for service delivery channels, uh, what we mean by lack of investment is we are still using the same model as we have used since 1976 uh, with little or no change. So if the model is really a government-centric model uh, that is publicly financed and publicly delivered. Okay. What this means is the central government manages the entire supply chain, the stock procurement, monitoring, um, and then local government is the primary um, service delivery points for immunization services to the primary care facilities. So there's literally limited collaboration and um, communication with the private sector um, in terms of how to uh, expand service delivery into private providers. Uh, last, we will end with the uh, recommendations. So our recommendations are divided into three broad goals over the short and medium term. Short term recommendations are about immediately addressing supply side constraints and medium terms, term ones are more about innovations in EPI systems. The first school is about expediting procurement and ensuring the stability of national supply of vaccines. In the short term, DOH should really consider uh, procuring other basic vaccines from UNICEF and utilizing DBM's uh, multi-year obligation authority where you can contract a, a, a party over more than one year okay. and also investigate and resolve the delays uh, in the procurement process. In the medium term, there needs to be more decision, uh, a more stable source of the vaccine and a, deci a decision on where we are going to source our vaccine supplies. Will that be UNICEF, will that be parallel importation or will that be local capacity to manufacture? So some other countries have decided to uh, procure primarily through UNICEF or imports. The second, the second goal is about investing in system strengthening for EPI and not solely purchase new vaccines. In the short term, this means augmenting the quantity and skills of the EPI staff in the DOH central office um, and updating and allocating budget for things like expanding storage capacity, vaccine distribution, and soft components like capacity building for LGU service delivery providers. Okay. Long term, EPI may think of tapping the private sector and take, taking advantage of field health financing and the UHC law, which requires designated primary health care positions. For efficiency, um, DOH may explore being the sole procurer, but being able to distribute both the public and private sector, or even contracting out parts of the supply chain. Um, the last goal is about monitoring and evaluation. Um, short term, EPI may focus on technical assistance um, to LGUs uh, that really have low vaccine coverage and addressing the inequities in timeliness and coverage among those uh, areas. It can also start thinking about the timeliness of vaccination as additional performance metric and investing in electronic systems to monitor logistics and stock, um, such as what they have uh, started, uh, a web-based vaccine inventory with our ITM. So long term, uh, a good thing would be to establish an electronic immunization registry, taking advantage of the new national ID system, which could give EPI counts for need assessment uh, and distribution of stock to LGUs and not just base it on projections and census data. Okay. This could also help in identifying children for catch up vaccinations and help uh, DOH and um, EPI move from uh, limited uh, limited and untimely national surveys like the NDHS or the FHSIS. So with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. 
And thank you to Jana uh, for your concise presentation. I think you and you issues surrounding or um, affecting uh, the uh, the con the implementation of the government's uh, immunization program. Let's now proceed to the um, second uh, presentation, which is on uh, non-communicable diseases in the Philippines and the capacity of our primary healthcare system to respond to the rising cases. And to present the study is Dr. Val Ule. He is a research uh, fellow at the um, uh, PIDS, whose research areas include health financing, health service, delivery, and nutrition. And prior to joining PIDS, he worked at the World Bank in Washington and Delhi. And uh, he was uh, part of a team that provided analytical products for India, Maldives, Bhutan, Croatia, and Afghanistan on nutrition and a universal health co coverage. He was also a doctoral fellow at the University of Toronto Center for Global Health Research. He holds a PhD in health economics from Canada and a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of the Philippines. I now give the floor to Dr. Ulef for his presentation. Over to you, Val. Thank you, Ma'am Sheila. <clears throat> so the title of my presentation um, is uh, Primary Care for Non-Communicable Diseases in the Philippines. So my co-author uh, for this paper um, is or Jana Uy and Mr. Lal Casa, so both researcher at PIDS. So the objective of the paper is to basically understand the readiness of primary care system uh, in the provide in the provision of non-communicable uh, disease services. So basically, the flow of my presentation will be uh, the status of the first one will be the status of non-communicable diseases in the Philippines. So where are we now? The second part will be about primary care. So uh, we need to I need to provide some concepts of primary care and how do we understand it. And the third part will be finding the nexus for the relationship of primary care and non-communicable diseases. And the last one will be an assessment of the readiness of primary care system uh, uh, in terms of financing, service delivery, human resources. Um, uh, and governance. So you can actually find the full paper in our PIDS website. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, before I go on, I just want to um, define what non-communicable diseases are. Right. So as Mam Sel mentioned a while ago, so NCDs are chronic conditions, right? These are long long duration conditions that result to do as a, it is a, it's a it's a result of different combination of genetics physiological environmental and behavioral factors right so the examples of cardiovascular uh, the examples of non-communicable diseases are cardiovascular diseases as you know heart attacks strokes right uh different types of cancers um, chronic respiratory diseases such as copd asthma and diabetes so these are some of the So are we now in slide three? Yes, we are on slide okay. three. So, so, okay, so NCDs are now the leading causes of morbidity and mortality in, in, the, in the country, right? Here you can see uh, DALIS is a globally accepted measure of morbidity and mortality. We call it the disability adjusted life years. You can see here that the share of non-communicable diseases are increasing rapidly in the last 10 years. So currently around 65% of the total DALIs are accounted for non-communicable diseases. So if you look at uh, mortality or death, that NCD accounts for about 68%. So we expect that the share of non-communicable diseases will continue to increase in the medium to long term. So in, in our paper, uh, Jan and I made some projections on, on, on the, the, the trajectory of non-communicable diseases. And our estimate that our estimate is that the number of NCD cases will double in the next 20 years. 
Next slide, please. So if you look at the epidemiologic uh, distribution or pattern, non-communicable diseases um, and infectious diseases are still the major causes of disease burden in the country. So when I say infectious diseases, these are your tuberculosis, um, respiratory tract infection. So they remain a major cause of burden. So, but over time you would see that they are decreasing similar to a lot of developing countries, right? But for NCD, the burden is actually increasing rapidly. So you would see ischemic heart disease, um, stroke, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and COP, they're actually increasing very rapidly. So, so what is the implication of this uh, increasing NCD? So as Mam uh, Sela mentioned a while ago, NCDs in general are very expensive because of the chronic nature of the disease. So once you have it, once you have a diabetes, for example, you have that lifetime, right? Um, um, and a bunch of studies already have examined not only the, the implications of NCD, having an NCD on health spending, on, on poverty, et cetera, but also the, the larger impact or the broader impact of NCDs and economic productivity, et cetera. So, so and, and in addition to that, treatment of NCDs are actually very hard. It's very resource intensive for providers, et cetera. You need to change the way how we deliver services. It's more intensive. You need more. You need more MRI, etc. So it's it's a very resource intensive um, um, health system. Right. Next slide, please. So NCDs are now afflicting the poor. So while at the global level there is this perception that NCDs are now afflicting the poor, evidence remains to be very limited, right? So what we did, John and I cleaned and analyzed the mortality data, like millions of data points from the uh, PSA, and we merged it with the poverty incidence of municipalities, right, in the Philippines. So while the share, look at if you look at the, the, the graph, while the share of non-communicable diseases remains to be higher among the rich, which is expected, right, the share of NCD is actually increasing rapidly among the fifth class uh, municipalities in the Philippines, and if you look at um, the richest LGU, it's already plateauing, which is actually a very uh, consistent picture in developing developed country um, um, epidemiological uh, picture, right? Next slide, please. So if you look at the premature NCD debt, so um, it's quite high in poorest local government, so the share uh, among the richest LGU, I mean the share of premature death of NC, in, in NCD is relatively lower among, in, in the richest uh, local governments. Right? So when I say premature death, these are um, deaths occurring before the life expectancy. So you can see that you can see a very nice gradient here. Um, the share of premature death uh, increases as poverty incidence increases. So this reflects the, the poor uh, prognosis, right, of non-communicable diseases, and this can be driven a lot of factors, perhaps access to healthcare services, etc. Next slide, please. So the increasing burden of non-communicable diseases is driven primarily by the increasing risk factors, for example, hypertension, right, uh, high blood sugar, um, uh, obesity, or high BMI high blood uh, cholesterol and smoking. So you could see the red uh, uh, the red figures. So these are the share of uh, total DALIs attributed to these risk factors. Next slide, please. So, so, so that's basically uh, the status of non-communicable diseases in the Philippines. So, so before I connect the two, I want to describe a bit what primary care is because uh, we need to make sure that we are at the same uh, have the same understanding what primary care is. So if you look at, there's a lot of definition of primary care, but the most uh, uh, um, uh, common definition of primary care is a level of healthcare system that provides entry to the system for all new, for all new needs and problems, provides person focus, um, not, not totally disease-oriented uh, care over time, and provides for all but very uncommon unusual condition and coordinates or integrates care provided elsewhere by others. So this definition, if you try to, 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 to understand this further, there are four important concepts in this definition. Number one is accessibility, right? Meaning that the health facility should be near to the people. It should be near to the community, right? It should be within his community. 
The second is comprehensiveness, meaning that essential health services that the population needs are addressed. So these are the first contact services. So for example, if I if I have a family planning need, right? If I need a condom, etc., I will go to that facility, right? Um, um, if I have cough, I will go there uh, immediately and not to the hospital. In short, if I have any concern, I, I, I have I have um, I have a facility to to actually visit. So imagine the relationship of the patient and provider is very critical here. So imagine you have a family doctor, right? Um, the, the, another important concept of primary care is continuity, means um, that the patient has a constant, constant, I want to emphasize the word constant relationship with the provider who take cares of you all throughout, right? So, uh, and not just only a particular period in time. Um, and last one is coordination. The primary care facility will help you navigate the, uh, navigate uh, uh, in the in the in the health system, so it will actually help you find hospitals, for example, if you need one, right? So there is actually a good referral system. So so I just want to give an example to this. So so this so this was this is what happened during COVID, right? Most Filipinos do not have any relationship with the health system, and primary care system is actually your umbilical cord to the health system. So for example, if you have cough because if you feel that you have COVID, you don't know what where to go, right? Because you do not have that, that, umb that umbilical cord or that connection to the health system. So yeah, because we do not have, you know, most of us do not have that relationship with the health system, right? That's why primary care is very, very important. So next slide. So this is basically uh, some of the important concepts of, uh, of I mean, the, the important concepts of primary care. So access, I uh, mentioned a while ago, comprehensiveness, when I say comprehensive, that all types of services should be there, basic essential services. Second, third is continuity. So you have the person have an important relationship with the health system, like you have a family doctor or you have a family nurse that if you need anything, you will go there. And the last one is coordination. So there is gatekeeping, uh, there is collaboration with, with hospitals, et cetera. So it is highly integrated to the health system. So next slide. So, so basically, this is what uh, a typical pathway of a well-functioning primary care. So even if you, you are not sick, if you, have, if you are not, if you don't have symptoms, you still have relationship to the primary care facility, right? So you have connection already, right? So that's why you will see the, 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 the person below that, like, she has connection in the primary care facility, even if she's not sick, right? So... So if, if the person got sick, the, the primary care facility will refer that person to a level one hospital. And if the, if the level one hospital cannot, if the patient needs more higher level of care, that person will be referred to an end referral hospital, right? So that's how a typical primary care uh, system works in many developed and highly functional health systems, right? Next slide. So, so why why primary care is the optimal channel for healthcare system um, response to NCD? So, in, as I've said, in addition to the fact that there is actually overwhelming em empirical evidence that suggests that primary care leads to better health outcomes, better quality care, and efficiency, it is important to uh, understand two important concepts. So, I think it's important to examine the nature of two diseases: infectious diseases and non-communicable diseases. So. Um, remember that the goal of any infectious disease, let's say, for example, pneumonia or uh, diarrhea, the goal is actually to remove the infectious agent, which is, let's say, bacteria or virus. So, so and that's it, right? So once you remove the bacteria, you'll, you'll be fine. So, so that's why episodic delivery of care is actually justifiable. So you just go to a facility, you don't have any relationship with the facility, and that's it, right? You just get antibiotics and you're done. But remember that the goal of NCD is different. The difference is not to eliminate infectious diseases, but the common goal of NCD is actually to reduce the symptom. You reduce the pain, you improve the quality of life. So because you know you cannot you cannot eliminate diabetes, right? 
So episodic delivery or one-time relationship of your health, of your physician or your provider is not really optimal and it will not work. So what works is that the NCD, you have a continuous care or relationship throughout your lifespan. So you need to have a very, very strong relationship with the provider. So that's why NCD is actually a very important driver. I mean, import, uh, primary care is an important tool in addressing non-communicable diseases. What we are is our health system is very episodic, right? It's not from, it's, it's everyone is working, health facilities are working in silos, right? But it will not work if most of your common diseases are non-communicable diseases because you need interactions and interlinkages with facilities. So next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> Hello? Val, we're on um, slide for Slide 14 is flash on the screen. Uh, yes, I think I'm... Yeah, I'm still in the primary care, uh, the goal and relationship. I think the next slide should be different, right? Uh, okay, so this is the next slide. So yes, I just want to... Yes. And, no, can you go back? So... These are the dip so most of the critical interventions in NCDs could be, you know, um, um, could be done in a primary care facility. And NCD prevention and control and intervention can be classified into two, like primordial intervention. I mean, next slide, please. So primordial intervention, yes. uh, primary uh, prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. When I say primordial, is that before you have the risk factor, right? Um, you have already connection. So this the, the function of your primary care is to promote physical activity, population-based anti-smoking campaign, promotion of healthy diet. When you say primary prevention, is that you prevent the risk factors. Like the primary care facility should be able to provide smoking cessation intervention because you already have the risk factor uh, like smoking. You have already the risk factor of high BMI. So the primary care should be able to give you advice on weight control, etc. The second diet prevention is actually um, more on screening. So the primary care facility should be able to do pap smear, um, risk screening for cardiovascular or clinical breast exam for possible breast cancer, et cetera. And when I say tertiary prevention, these are when you have already the disease, it, it should be able to provide services that control the disease, right? Like for example, uh, glucose control, so um, BP control, uh, um, uh, maintenance provision of maintenance drug, etc. So all these prevention services should be able to be provided in 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 a primary care uh, setting. Right. Set. Next slide. So so another is we expect that non-communicable diseases will be the dominant cause of disease burden, as I've mentioned a while ago. So hence the the most efficient way to address is through primary care. So John and I did some like Markov model to project the number of primary care visits related to NCD uh, in, in a midst of the growing number of NCD. So you can see the majority of primary care visits in the next 20 years will be primarily driven by non-communicable diseases. And if you look, infectious diseases and injuries will, will continue to plateau. So um, hence, the, we need to prepare the system. So we need to make sure that our primary care system is re ready to face the changing epidemiologic pattern. So next slide. So, so I think the question now is how do we achieve primary care oriented health system? So how do we strengthen it? So I mentioned a while ago that there are four features or processes essential in primary care. These are your access comprehensiveness, uh, continuity and coordination. However, for this to happen, it needs to have a proper bedrock that needs to be in place, right? That is your financing system should allow that, your governance system should allow that to, to have com accessible, comprehensive, continuity and coordinated care. Um, your HR should be able to do that. So we're going to assess uh, these different um, uh, domains, or I will call it like uh, building blocks. And if you look at the double H or bedrock of primary care services. So um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. So before that, I want to mention the service delivery points of NCD. So I've mentioned there are two uh, um, uh, um, uh, two uh, service delivery points. Number one is your Barangay Health Station. Uh, the, the, the function of BHS should have the ability to provide primordial services, primary and secondary services, but sometimes it's very limited. The second is rural health units or your rural health units, right? Your RH or city health units. So that is the owner of that is your municipality. 
um, and the catchment is usually um, municipality, right? So, so the, the NCD function of your primary care, I mean your RHU is primordial, similar to BHS. Uh, the, the RHU should be able to provide primary care prevention, screening and diagnosis, etc. Uh, so it can provide primary, secondary, and tertiary. Next slide. So let's start with governance, right? Let's start with the governance structure. The figure is basically um, showing you the devolved setup of the healthcare system. So basically the municipalities are expected to deliver and finance your health interventions, including your non-communicable diseases. So the primary care facility, meaning the BHS and your RHU, are owned and operated by their local government units or your municipality. But the owner of the hospitals are mostly the provinces or you know, mostly the provinces. So health facilities are operating in silos because they are viewed as an individual facility, not as a network of facilities. So there is no formal linkage between RHU and a level one facility in the Philippines. And again, this violates the most important tenet of primary care, which is there is a continuity of care. So in the past, we have tried to do like interlocal health zones, etc. But these arrangements are very, very informal. And to be honest, they're quite loose. So, so if you look at maybe if there is a, a, an assessment of interlocal health zone, they didn't, they didn't actually succeed because the, 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 the relationship of facilities are very um, informal. So, so, in, so this is the public system. And there is also a parallel private system. Again, there is no interlinkage between public and private facilities. Even between private facilities, they, they seldom exist. A private primary care facility and a private hospital, they are not talking to each other. There's no way that they are actually talking to each other. So that's how the fragmented system is, which is very common in many developing countries. But in many advanced societies, they were able to integrate those types of different health facilities regardless of level. Yeah. So next slide. So this is actually the patient journey, right? The lack of integration among health facilities. So, so if you are, if you, so this is a typical one, I would say. So if you are not sick, you will not go to a facility, right? So if you are sick, you can go anywhere. You can go to a primary care facility. You can go to hospital one, level one. You can go to hospital level two. You can actually go to a pharmacy, right? But that's how the how the, our the patient journey is. So, so when you look at, for example, PhilHealth, there are diseases like asthma, for example, that can be actually treated in primary care facility, but it's actually one of the top claims in hospitals, right? So, so, so there is actually inefficiencies already that you see. So um, this, is, this is actually violating most of the important primary care concepts um, um, uh, um, at the global level, right? So next slide, please. So we tried to look at um, the bypassing of um, uh, the bypassing of primary care facilities. So currently, unlike other countries where they can actually monitor referral system, in the Philippines, you do not have the capacity to monitor given the fragmented system. So for example, in many countries, I'm not sure, like Thailand, for example, um, they, they, should, they should be able to track the patients, right? Where are they going from referral, I mean, from primary care and refer to the facility, etc. They are able to monitor that. So we tried to use NBHS to examine those people with NCDs, right? And and just to have an idea on the level of bypassing that is happening. And you can see that a lot of rich people are going to hospitals for consultation. So you can see highly, highly segmented market, uh, and you want to see patients to go to primary care facilities, but instead they're going to hospitals. And actually, that is also a reflection in, 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 in COVID, right? Like we do, not, we do not have a relationship with the primary care facility, so our tendency to actually go to a hospital. So lack of efficiency is also happening uh, because of you know practice of bypassing uh, I mentioned a while ago. So next slide. So let's discuss the availability of primary care facilities, rural health unit, because remember, the most important tenet of primary care is accessibility. So it should be close to people. According to DOH, the travel time of our issue should be 30 minutes. So together with DOH, we, we analyze um, uh, using GIS, we examine how many people have access to RHU within 30 minutes, and you would be amazed that only 50% of the population have access to RHU within 30 minutes. Currently, we do not know the stock of privately owned primary care facility. The, the UH do not monitor this at all, but there is now a move to track them. So we don't know what's happening in the private sector. Next slide. Um, same, same also with BHS or Barangay Health Station. Only half of barangays have BHS. 
if you, if you look at the local government code, each barangay should have BHS, but only 40% that's our estimate have BHS. Next slide. Uh, so while the availability of and accessibility of primary care, but the capacity of primary care is also essential. So we tried to do some very uh, random survey. So we, uh, under these studies, we conducted a survey of 20 RHUs and the capacity is highly variable. For instance, of the 10 RHUs we surveyed, only facilities have the complete tools and equipment to screen NCDs. We really need to check not only the availability of health facility, but the capacity to provide very, very basic health services. Let's next slide. So let's go to financing. So you can see here that NCD accounts for a big chunk of our total health spending in the country. And this is expected to continue in the medium term, right, given the trajectory of uh, epidemiological diseases. Uh, so if we, um, so you can see here that NCD, which is the gray one, now accounts for a very big chunk of, of, of total health spending. So we analyze this one using the national health accounts. Next slide. So, so if we actually analyze spending, health spending by provider, around 4% only accounts for primary care in the Philippines. If we, for example, share share the spending of other countries, for example, sorry, I keep mentioning Thailand, so we actually uh, collaborated with Thai researcher on this one. They're actually spending around 10% of their health spending for primary care. So we are actually spending around $6 per person that's already for both public and private. But my assumption here is that is actually mostly private. So you would expect like $2 per person from the public system. So and most of these are very, as I've said, it's private. Right? Next slide. So um, please note that the delivery of health services, now we're going to uh, the still financing. Please note that delivery of health services is the main role of local governments, right? but the capacity of local government to finance health services is highly variable. So here we can see that large variation in health spending that you would expect Makati will be in the top, like Sulu will be in the, in the bottom. Right? So local health spending is a challenge. So this one underlies you have issues in the in, in uh, uh, local budgets for health. Right? So you have problems with HR, medicine, technology, et cetera. So, so the decision, the lack of budget is actually uh, a decision or the priority of local government executives, like oftentimes, the LGU cannot afford to a lot more because it, yeah, you know, it must fund other programs. We know this already. So it's a very prominent issue, especially in poorer local government, based on our key informants and uh, surveys. Right. So slide, next slide, please. So, so with the limited public spending of local governments, others are actually trying to get others financing sources. Number one is DOH subsidies like HFEP, human resources, etc. So, you know, sometimes PhilHealth also reimburses primary care benefit, but it's very limited. Um, um, and yeah, so it's the, the system, the, the financing system is very fragmented in a way that it, it dilutes the purchasing power of, of, of your purchaser, right? So, um, um, so th that's a very, very big problem. So next slide. Next slide. Next slide. So with the public spending, right? Um, the problem is that um, the DOH remains to be an important financing, right? Uh, source of financing. Remember, because the local government do not have enough capacity, the national government actually provide grants to local government to actually provide technical assistance um, to, look, uh, to municipalities to build rural health units, barangay health station. We've analyzed actually HFEP. And um, you would see an equitable distribution. So the technical assistance of the national government to augment primary care facilities at our RHS is highly inequitable. So we've analyzed it and we've seen that the allocation is based on poverty, but it's actually based on actually requests. So you would see that a lot of H spending for RHS are going to the rich municipalities and not the poor municipalities. So this is actually a very, very alarming and, and very striking way of how we provide technical assistance to local government. There's no framework at all. Next slide. So the low public spending um, insurance, when I say public spending, this is your health insurance, local government spending and national spending. Hence you would expect that most spending in NCD services at the primary level is mostly out of pocket. So you would see the blue line. 
Um, it's almost all out of pocket, very small, fill health. Um, it, it's dominated basically by um, out of pocket salary, out of pocket loan, out of pocket donation. So, so it, you know, it's private out of pocket. Next slide. So let's go to HR. So um, um, only 10% of RHUs in the country do not have doctors. So if you look at current guidelines, local government should have, I mean, RHU should have doctors and nurses, right? Um, so, but you would see lots of RHUs do not have that, do not have uh, doctors. Next slide. Um, another important, uh, important is the limited capacity of health workers to conduct NCD programs. Very problematic and disease focus. So lack of staff uh, relative to health programs and lack of training opportunities for NC and CDs, right? So these are the common themes that keep occurring if you do um, if you go if you go down at the at the grassroots level. So health workers are implementing NCD programs at least 10 with other 10 DOH programs. So imagine if you are RH11. If you're a, a, a municipal health officer, you need to in, you need to provide at least ten programs: NCD program, family planning program, immunization, etc. So you expect that to be delivered by a one physician, and in addition, that there is administrative uh, administrative functions. Right. Next slide. So again, another important is the limited capacity to provide health workers. Uh, I mean, limited capacity to provide uh, or conduct um, 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 NCD services. Like, for example, um, um, uh, one of the KIs is um, the inability for for um, uh, um, nurses and doctors to um, to provide um, um, visual inspection of cervical uh, uh, screening, right? Because they only train the doctor, but the doctor is so busy. So the nurses or the, the, the midwife cannot do it because they did not attend the training, something like that. So there are a lot of issues on how uh, the trainings are cascaded. Next slide. So here, I mean, this is also common, so stack out. So we've also analyzed the stack out of NCD drugs in BHS and RHU. You would see a, a lot of them experience stack outs of most common NCD drugs. So I will not go through that. Um, um, next slide. Um, so health information is also a problem because there is no integration in health facilities. You would expect that you know you will not be able to understand what's happening or the interconnection of health facilities, right? So another is monitoring of evaluation for NCD services are weak. So LGUs primarily rely on counts and cases on death. They do not have patient management targets or indicator to actually measure the effectiveness of NCDs for in, in information. So it's also difficult to collect data for indicators that require blood chemistry, et cetera, um, to actually measure um, uh, secondary inputs. So I will not go through the details. Uh, next slide. I think I don't have time. Uh, so here are some of the, uh, some, uh, these are the summary issues under each domain, fragmented lack of integration among health facilities. So that's for handle health information. I mean, sorry, this is for health service delivery. So lack of gatekeeping, overlapping functions of national and local governments, under financing, limited spending for primary care, multiple sources of financing that weakens purchasing power, out of pocket remains to be a major source, field health spending is negligible in terms of primary care, inequalities and in grants from national and local governments. For, for human resources, this is a scarcity of human resources, limited capacity to implement NCD services, and very disease-oriented programmatic vertical type of delivery of uh, health services. Next slide. Um, so here under, um, sorry, this for, for, for health information, I, I, should, I should put this under health information, is scarcity of primary care facility, um, and the second is the large, uh, the, uh, the, the, the lack of data on sec, uh, the lack of data for primary care providers. Um, for drugs, um, uh, um, um, stack out is very common. So next slide. So these are some of our recommendations. Um, um, so we are only providing two important recommendations um, under this one. So we call it short term and medium term. And the goal really is to improve efficiency and coverage. Number one, 
Because we know this already that we need to advance primary care benefit package, and that includes the provision of telemedicine. And under the, the primary care benefit package, allow the private sector to provide healthcare service under primary care uh, benefits, right? So there are innovative models like LGUs can actually contract out private providers to deliver a gamut of health services like those things. Second is explore the use of blended provider payments to, to drive optimal behavior. For example, the use of capitation for outpatient visits, but for example, um, and the use of fee-for-service for a screening, like acetic acid screening, right? So they do this in many advanced societies or advanced health system because you want, if you do fee-for-service, you want to get more acetic acid tests and screening tests, right? So the, the financing mechanism or the provider payment should be different, not only because we have the tendency to say, oh, let's just do capitation, but it depends on the health system goal, right? Another is reduce the fragmentation and I call it the schizophrenia in the financing sources, you know, delineate the role of QH in field health in purchase, improve purchasing power. So I think the DH is slowly transitioning its commodities. So we need to, to think about on how to do this. Next slide. Um, so for health service delivery, again, is to the goal is to improve efficiency. The first one is to actually advance the implementation of the UHC Act. Right? So integrate the facilities through the creation of the HPCN. So if we were able to integrate the, the, the core problem of integration in health information and health financing, we'll be able to address that, right? So you can do that with the national government should provide financial and non-financial in, incentives for provinces to integrate. Right now, there is no actual incentives for provinces to integrate their health services. I mean, integrate all the municipalities because there is you know, a political barrier there. And the only way to do that is to provide incentives, right? Um, you can also see some countries like the UK system, et cetera, finding mechanisms, how to integrate different facilities at the, provide, uh, at, the, at the provincial level. Another is comprehensive and smart technical assistance to local government. I think this is referring to the national government or the DH should actually provide local governments, technical assistance to local governments who are actually in dire need, not not those local governments who can actually, you know, um, who can actually afford it, right? So, and, and that goes through HFAP, HR, et cetera. Um, um, second is integrated care planning within the DPC, DPC, DPCB, right? So, so the way we plan now is that, um, okay, there will be program for immunization, there will be program for for NCD, the real program for, I don't know. So the, the goal there is actually to integrate them and look at them holistically, right? And when we provide services to local government, it's not very sporadic. It's not, okay, let's just give HR. They give like commodities. Like the way you do things is that you understand like the whole gamut of problem. Like in Ilocos Norte, for example, they lack HR, they lack HF, they lack commodities. Then you give them at the same time, not like, the facility, I mean, the, the program office are not talking to each other. So when you give them, they may have commodity, but they don't have HR, which is a very, very common problem, or they have HR, but they don't have commodity. So it's actually time to actually integrate it, right? So um, I think that's my last slide. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Val for your uh, for giving us a comprehensive analysis of our primary health care structure and how this current structure limits our health sector to make an effective response to the increasing uh, burden of NCDs in the country. Uh, friends, uh, at this point, let's hear what our discussants have to say about the findings and recommendations. Uh, presented by our uh, two speakers. So we have three discussants, two of whom are from the Department of Health and directly involved in the health programs we heard a while ago, while our other discussant is from PhilHealth. We're, uh, we will hear first from uh, Dr. Maria Rosario Silvia Uy, who is the lead of the Non-Communicable Disease Subgroup, uh, Disease Prevention and Control Bureau, at the Department of Health. Uh, prior to working at DOH, she served at the Department of Pediatrics, Cotabato Regional and Medical Center for years. She also worked as a primary uh, care physician at the San, San Francisco Del Monte Health Center in Quezon City and later 
at the Smoky Mountain Health Center in Tondo, Manila. She then, uh, she then transferred to DOH where she served as the focal person of the Violence and Injury Prevention Program, Prevention of Blindness Program, and Chronic Kidney Disease Prevention and Control. I now give the floor to Dr. Uh, Maria Rosario Silvia Uy. Over to you now, ma'am. Afternoon po, Ma'am Sheila, thank you. Could I share my screen? Go ahead, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Uwe. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start my presentation, I would like to thank and at the same time congratulate Dr. Valerie Ulet, Ms. Jana Uwe, and Mr. Lyle Casas for coming up with this timely and relevant research. This study actually validated our previous assessment of the primary health care on NCDs. So that's actually giving you a hint of my stand with regards to the findings. So here are my reactions and comments. Lack of gatekeeping. Strengthening the gatekeeping function of our primary care facilities is one of the thrusts of the universal health care and even the previous Formula One Plus strategy of the Department of Health. Sadly, as pointed out in your study, most of the patients flock to public and private hospitals and clinics. However, during this pandemic, ironically, patients go to our RHUs because they are afraid of going to the hospitals and contacting COVID. I don't know if I should be glad about this situation or not. Limited spending on primary care at the local level, inequitable grants from national to local. With the devolution set up, the LGUs are, done, are mandated to provide health care services and implement the programs of the Department of Health. And some operate on the principle of buy-in, which means they invest in programs with high return of investment, resulting in discrepancies in investments of LGUs in health programs. This is oriented, programmatic, vertical, Agree, guilty, scarcity of primary care facilities, agree, stock out are common. This is expected based on the pharmaceutical management info system report for the example for the first quarter of 2021, stock outs or no stocks can be found in 85 to 95 percent of RHUs for fast moving meds such as glycoside, amlodipine, and simvastatin and stock outs in 25 to 45% of our HUs for other medicines. The medicines coming from the central office is purely for augmentation purposes. So the LGUs have to procure their own medicines based on their allocation needs, not the other way around. Paper-based medical record system. I beg to disagree with this. The DOH has iClinicsys, a web-based reporting system on NCDs. 1,854 out of 2,500 RHUs or 74% use our iClinicsys. The rural health units need to report to our iClinicsys for their claims from PhilHealth. Monitoring and evaluation of NCD services is weak. I agree with this. For the past three years, MNE of NCD services have been put aside to give way to all the moratoriums and monitoring and uh, PIRs due to the dengue issue, measles, polio outbreak, COVID. However, we have an existing MNE tool as well as indicators which have been previously used. Republic Act 11223. UHC stipulates that all Filipinos are guaranteed equitable access to quality and affordable healthcare goods and services, 
protection against financial risk, and a health care delivery system that will afford every Filipino a primary care provider. Strengthening the primary care level plays a crucial role in progressively realizing universal health care. This shift is consistent with the global consensus that having a strong primary care system is necessary to accelerate universal health care. This might be the answer we are looking for to all of our problems. The traditional is vertical per program. Vertical programs have fragmented the delivery of health services all the way down to the local level. Our staff in our rural health units have assumed vertical program roles and have not been holistic in their approach to patients, contrary to our UHC definition of primary care. For the implementation of universal health care, primary care should be horizontal meaning primary care workers should know how to manage the spectrum of diseases they encounter in our primary care facilities. Primary care is defined as the provision of first contact care that is comprehensive, continuing, and coordinated within the network. There have been many attempts to achieve universal health care even before the release of the UHC law. Many approaches and strategies from different administrations administrations, but all with the same purpose, universal health coverage. Finally, there was a strong push when the UHC law was released, providing clarity on the area of focus, which is really primary care. The Disease Prevention and Control Bureau spearheads the development of guidelines to define primary care services, which shall serve as basis for comprehensive primary care benefit package development and DOH programs. So from policy and planning to the development of the manual of procedures to monitoring and evaluation to transitioning of budget and commodities. These are our current efforts of the Department of Health. Most of these reforms are works in progress, but we do hope that these measures will be able to address most of the challenges in our primary health care. DOH Administrative Order 2020-0040, which was issued in September of last year. Uh, development of primary care service uh, manual of procedures, development of primary care service training module, and health services integration. Administrative Order number 2020-0040, entitled Guidelines in the Classification of Individual-Based and Population-Based Primary Care Service Packages. Highlights of the AO, Primary Care Service Package, Criteria for Identifying and Classifying Individual and Population-Based Primary Care Services, Financing of Primary Care Service Package. This uh, contains a standard package of health services provided by primary care facilities with Annex A, which outlines the individual-based health services disaggregated by age groups and life stages. The complete list of these services shall be further expounded in the Manual of Operations and Procedures. Development of the Primary Care Service Manual of Procedures. This manual focuses on promotive and preventive care, which includes environmental and social interventions, behavior change, risk assessment, early diagnosis, treatment and care, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative care. This contains primary care services for non-communicable diseases, starting from screening, laboratories, and ancillary procedures, and curative services, which includes provision of medications and counseling, as well as lifestyle modification The parts of the manual uh, focuses on primary care service packages for all life stages from pregnant, newborn and infant, child and adolescent, adult and older person. The packages include population-based services, individual-based services for well individuals, individual-based services for sick individuals, including for infectious and non-infectious diseases, which also includes the non-communicable diseases. 
uh, what bogged down the process is the need to align all the laboratory and ancillary procedures with other central offices' needs of inclusion, including care health. Development of primary care training package. A primary care worker shall be competent to provide all primary care services. Primary care provider shall act as navigator, coordinator, initial and continuing point of contact in the healthcare delivery system. These are the competencies that all primary care workers need to enhance to efficiently deliver primary care service. This is just an example of what uh, the instructional design that we are developing for the training packages. Health services integration may mean a package of preventive and curative health interventions for a particular population group, multipurpose service delivery points, achieving continuity of care over time, integration of different levels of service, and working across sectors. This is still a work in progress. We are exploring avenues for integration of the core processes and redesigning program approaches. Whether integration in the policy and standards, TA and resource management, transitioning of financing for primary care commodities, streamlining procurement through pooled procurement platforms or through sectoral and local engagements. So way forward. The MOP on primary care is expected to be finished at the second quarter of this year and will be disseminated to our uh, Centers for Health Development for a department order. There are ongoing consultations with PhilHealth for the primary care services, including screening and ancillary procedures and medications in the MOP to be included in the expansion of the consulta package of PhilHealth or in any new benefit package to be developed. The primary care training package is expected to be finished at the most by the third quarter of 2021, so that orientation of primary care health workers can be conducted and subsequent issuance of provisional primary care certificates to them. By 2023, this primary care worker shall undergo primary care assessment and certification and certification. Uh, next is DPCB restructuring with inclusion of UHC integration team. Prime implementation of the primary care uh, implementation of the primary care integration. Primary care integration especially for the four flagship programs of the Department of Health, namely Reproductive, Maternal, Newborn, Child Health and Nutrition, National Immunization Program, and PBHIB for integration into other technical programs. Timeline for implementation is third to fourth quarter of this year. We do hope that through the current efforts of the Department of Health, together with other agencies and organizations, partners, and concerned stakeholders, we would be able to realize an integrated and comprehensive primary care service, not only on non-communicable diseases, but also in other diseases and conditions in our local communities. Thank you and good afternoon. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ui, for your um, comments as well as uh, for your updates on what uh, the DOH is, is doing to address uh, the issues, the challenges in our immunization, in, in our uh, program to address uh, non-communicable diseases. Okay, so moving on, let us now listen to the comments of Dr. Kim Patrick Pihano. He's the manager of the National Immunization Program of the Department of Health. Dr. Pihano started as a health policy and systems research fellow at the OH and has worked on several programs and healthcare reforms including health financing and universal health care. He was also assigned to the DOH Public Health Services team to work on the primary, primary care framework and service delivery, service delivery strategies in the context of universal health care. I now give the floor to uh, Dr. Uh, Kim Patrick Tejano for his comments. Over to you, Dr. Tejano. 
Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Seeger, for the warm welcome. So, a pleasant afternoon to each and everyone. Uh, first, I would like to thank the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, headed by Dr. Salia Reyes, for inviting the National Immunization Program in this event. So, we basically gladly accepted this invitation as we currently commemorate the World Immunization Week. And we thought that this event would really be a relevant one as we dig deeper into the immunization status here in our country. Also, a big thanks to Dr. Valerie Gilbert Ulep and Ms. Jana Uy for taking a closer look into the program of the Department of Health. So I was recently delegated as the National Immunization Program last March. And a month before that, I think that was mid-February when Dr. Ulep, knowing that I will be the next program manager, kindly sent me the link to their study to this study, as well as to the to their PEED study in 2019 about vaccination. And while reading it, I was actually, um, it hit me when I reached the part on the supply side challenges of this, uh, of the EPI. Um, almost all local papers, for uh, seminars and webinars and all, focused mainly on the demand generation of vaccination. So how do we increase vaccine acceptance? How do we um, increase vaccine confidence, decrease the vaccine hesitancy. And supply side issues were left out in most of the discussions. And I personally appreciate this study because it opened up the other facet of the vaccination in the country. And to be honest, that made me a little bit apprehensive because I thought, wow, there would be a lot of challenges and actions that need to be taken for the supply side uh, aspect of the immunization program. Um, recently also, I was, uh, I attended a defense, this is defense as a panelist in an undergrad study examining a, the effective vaccine management of a local city in region two. And I am also very much delighted that they were interested in examining and analyzing the supply, supply uh, chain, whole chain, as well as the financing mechanisms of of the vaccination program at a local setting. So the city health officer of that city was also present in the panel and she gladly accepted and were open to uh, the recommendations of the study group. It was also an avenue to engage with the local government, especially, that the, lo especially the local health leaders to discuss this, these challenges and recommendations. Especially that we, especially we know that uh, health is one of the devolved um, uh, aspects of our government. So, hence, um, more studies are needed to evaluate vaccine supply chain and cold chain management to inform and guide our policymakers. So, the NIP is also planning to conduct an effective vaccine management assessment, um, probably at the last quarter of this year or next year, because the last uh, EVMA was conducted three or four years ago. And conducting another EVMA would actually be critical to check whether the uh, issues and challenges before were already addressed and to uh, find ways to um, address the recurring and new problems on the supply side of vaccination. So this study is actually an uh, opened a lot of avenues for us to improve our uh, supply side uh, management of the vaccination program. So another point that I want to um, raise is that the program has already taken initial steps to employ the recommendations of the study. So we have started to actually um, uh, develop the multi-year contracting agreement for the immunization program. So we sought the help of one of our uh, development partners, as well as the De Department of Budget Manage Management to guide the program and other DOH programs as well. We have also requested um, technical assistance from UNICEF for, to provide guidance and recommendations on redesigning the procurement practices and improving strategies for vaccine logistics, supply chain, um, cold chain, and delivery. And lastly, we have recently concluded the measles, rubella, oral polio vaccine supplemental immunization activity. And it was able to accomplish 90% coverage for measles, rubella, 
and uh, around 87% for oral polio vaccine. And to maintain the momentum of the high coverage of this supplemental immunization activity, we need to continue to collaborate with, uh, with different and various uh, stakeholders. So we have engaged with uh, professional societies, with, uh, with non-government organizations, even the private sectors, other na national government agencies, and especially the local government units. So during the campaign, we have partnered with um, Integrated uh, Midwives Association of the Philippines, Philippine Medical Association, Philippine uh, Society, Pediatric Society, and a lot more. So such partnership enabled us to achieve um, high coverage during the CIA, which we truly hope that we, it will be the same for the other antigens under the NIP and the routine immunization as well, so that there will be no outbreaks in the future and there will be minimal supplemental immunization activity will, that will be conducted. So we are also expanding our uh, engagements with other stakeholders as we explore uh, more measures to reach, uh, to reach higher coverage for our routine immunization. So for example, as we explore, um, uh, explore vaccination as a requirement prior to entering the school, we need to consult with DepEd. And as we um, consider expanding the cadres to administer vaccines, we need to consult with CHED and with uh, Philippine Regulation, uh, Professional Regulation Commission. So to summarize, I have the three points that I wanted to point out um, in, the, in, in my comments. Um, can we please show the slide? So the first one is that uh, um, more studies would be needed to are needed to evaluate actually the vaccine supply chain and cold chain management. So we need more studies like this for us, for the Department of Health, most specifically our program, to uh, create and to guide our policies. So another one is that we are starting to take actions to address the supply side concerns through the MICA and um, getting technical assistance. Because uh, to be honest, we have, uh, over the years, we don't have any um, experts on procurement and on first and on uh, planning for these uh, commodities. And then lastly, is that continuous engagement with other stakeholders to ensure um, whole of society, whole of government, and whole of system approach in ensuring that the, all our eligible populations are vaccinated. And this goes well goes as well with the other programs at the Department of Health. And, and as an update again, lastly, um, we are currently drafting the National Immunization Program Strategic Plan. And we are actually considering this, the recommendations of this study. Of this study and one of the priorities is definitely um, uh, investing also in the non-vaccine commodities of the program. So that would be all. Thank you very much. And thank you very much as well, uh, Dr. Uh, Tijano. We appreciate your comments and your updates on what the Department of Health is doing for our uh, improve our uh, immunization uh, program. And uh, this uh, webinar is our small contribution to uh, to the uh, National Immunization Week. Okay, so friends. Um, well, moving on to our third uh, discussion, we cannot overemphasize enough the importance of effective and inclusive health financing to protect the population from financial risks uh, arising from health shocks. So this is why we also invited a representative from the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation or PhilHealth. So we have with us today, Ms. Annalisa De Leon, a Senior Social Insurance Specialist at the uh, Quality Assurance Group of Phil Health. She has been with Phil Health since 2000, and she holds a bachelor's degree in commerce from St. Louis University of City and a master's degree in business administration. So I now give the floor to Ms. De Leon. Over to you now, ma'am. Ms. De Leon, the floor is now yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, Thank you, PIDS, for inviting PhilHealth to be part of this uh, research forum. Uh, on behalf of PhilHealth, uh, health finance policy sector, and the PCB team, uh, I will now share our 
comments in the two studies. Okay. Uh, with the country's goal of progressively realizing universal healthcare coverage, the two studies presented uh, give val valuable insights on what uh, we could improve as policymakers and program implementers. So I would like to start the discussion by recognizing the major contributions of these research works. So the study on EPI or immunization highlighted the supply side system issues in implementing the program that resulted to vaccine Stake out, uh, stock out, uh, contrary to what we often perceive that low vaccination confidence or the demand side issues lead to low vaccination coverage. Um, on the other hand, the study on NCD program gave emphasis on the need to reorganize primary health care to provide integrated NCD services. As envisioned in the law, access to the particular services in these programs should be made available to all Filipinos, prioritizing those belonging to the poorest households and the disadvantaged populations. Uh, in terms of the strengths of the research studies, both studies were able to identify the challenges in the implementation of non-communicable disease programs and expanded immunization program, respectively. So this implementation bottlenecks give strong evidence on the need to change the way we are doing things in the program management cycle. So given these vertical uh, programs, the studies also provided us a picture of what the situation is in the country through up-to-date statistics and sound projections. So lastly, the studies also gave us concrete recommendations on what we could do to improve the processes for each program. This particularly applies to the study an assessment of the expanded program on immunization in the Philippines, where short-term and medium to long-term solutions were provided. So from the viewpoint of the researchers, the objective of their studies is to inform policy and improve the program implementation. Hence, the results of the studies are directed to policymakers and implementers in both the DOH and FILA. Uh, in terms of recommendations specific to the corporation, we want to also share with you what we are doing and where we stand when it comes to these issues. We would like to reiterate that the corporation is working towards implementing the health reforms envisioned in the Universal Health Care Act of the Philippines or Republic Act 11223, which also serves as basis for some recommendations given by the researchers of the study. So first, uh, let me talk about uh, uh, the study on primary health care for non-communicable diseases in the Philippines. Uh, we agree with the findings of the study that there is a need to strengthen the NCD management in the country, which calls for a stronger primary care system. The cases of non-communicable diseases will increase in the medium to long term. With this, the country needs to prepare itself to respond to the increased need for health care. Currently, the corporation has begun implementing the PhilHealth Consulta package that integrated the previous primary care benefits of the corporation, namely primary care benefit and the expanded primary care benefit. The primary goal of the package is to increase access to primary care and ensure 
ensure financial protection to all Philippines. So the study mentioned that PCBs uh, limited population coverage, but with PhilHealth Consulta, we are targeting to have each and every Filipino to be registered with their chosen PhilHealth Consulta provider pursuant to the UHC law. Uh, the PhilHealth Consulta package includes primary care consultation, targeted health risk screening and assessment, access to 13 laboratory and diagnostic services, and provision of 21 medicines. The services included address 80% of the most common outpatient consultations, specific, specifically hypertension, diabetes, upper respiratory tract infection, low risk pneumonia, acute gastroenteritis. The payment mechanism of the package is blended, uh, combining capitation with performance-based payment. Uh, this performance-based payment will include patient management targets where payments are divided into tranches according to the provider's compliance and performance. On the other hand, the evaluation of the expanded immunization program gave a more practical view on the matter and has provided, as with short-term and medium to long-term solutions to the issues they have identified. So as the study mentioned, the occasional breakouts that happen in the country suggest that there is under vaccination, untimely administration, and failure to meet and maintain the herd immunity level, signaling the need to improve the management and tackle the issues of the immunization program. So with the recommendation to shift financing from the DOH to PhilHealth, the corporation shall follow the guidelines set by the DOH. Currently, the Department of Health is finalizing the transitioning plan for commodities, defining individual and population-based services and is in touch with the corporation's representatives regarding the matter. Factors such as externality, econom economics of economics of say, scale, uh, sorry, economies, economies of scale, and availability in the market are being considered. This will also be affected by the Mandana's ruling of the Supreme Court, which calls for the national government agency to devolve services to the local government units corresponding to the increase in their internal revenue allotment. In the coming years, hopefully by year 2024, the corporation aims to transition consulta to the comprehensive outpatient benefit package mentioned in the UHC law. The health services will be expanded to cover different health conditions and needs among Philippines. The local government plays a key role as we shift towards a COPB since the law sees its implementation in the context of a healthcare provider network, the intent of which is to ensure provision of a full spectrum of care from primary to tertiary. And their response to integrate the local healthcare system will also define our intended health Currently, other research is 
studies are being conducted by our academic partners that will feed onto the policy for COPB, like for example, the study of Dr. Dan's. So we value the support of research institutions such as the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and will keep your inputs and recommendations to mind when we are drafting the policies, particularly in determining the basket of services to be included in the package. So including the PhilHealth Consulta package and later on the Comprehensive Outpatient Benefit Package in the National Health Insurance Program may pave the way for the country to contain costs, prevent crowding out in private facilities, and improve the overall system's efficiency. In terms of the reforms mandated by the Universal Healthcare Act that will impact not only the implementation of these two programs, but other aspects of the health system, various policies from the DOH have already been issued. So all of these policies serve as a reference in the corporation in the actual development of policies while ensuring harmonization of our work with that of the Department of Health. Challenges remain on how we could implement these reforms, but both agencies are working towards its full implementation in accordance with the law. We appreciate all the valuable information and inputs that the two studies have provided in ensuring the provision of quality health services to all Filipinos. As the national insurer, we shall continue to provide health insurance coverage and ensure affordable, acceptable, available, and accessible healthcare services for all citizens of the Philippines. Through to the mandate of the corporation, especially in this time of great So now my takeaway messages, Ma'am Sheila, and also to our uh, participants, one, that the corporation is working towards implementing the health reforms and vision in the Universal Health Care Act of the Philippines or Republic Act 11223. Number two, the corporation has begun implementing the PhilHealth Consulta package that integrated the previous primary care benefits of the corporation namely uh, primary care benefit and expanded primary care benefit, the primary goal of which is to increase access to primary care and to have each and every Filipino to be registered with their chosen PhilHealth consultant provider pursuant to the UHC. And the last, but not the least, challenges remain on how we could implement UHC reforms, but both the DOH and PhilHealth are working towards its full implementation in accordance to the law. And that in policy development, the DOH shall take the lead and their policy issuances will serve as the corporation's defense. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Maraming salamat din po, uh, Ms. Anna De Leon of uh, PhilHealth. Uh, I saw some very interesting questions in our uh, chat box, but before we proceed to the, uh, to the open forum, let us give our speakers a short break uh, before they start answering uh, questions. So let us have a poll. And uh, I hope you listen intently to the presentation of uh, of what Dr. Ulet, because I am getting the I, I I am getting the question. I will um, ask a question related to that presentation. So here is our uh, poll question for the week. 
what percentage of the country's total health spending is devoted to primary care? I repeat, what percentage of the country's total health spending is devoted to primary care? A, is it 8%, B, 6%, and C, 4%. Okay, so please key in your answer now. So you have five seconds to answer this question. And we are now, when we are now, uh, Okay, uh, I think I'm going to close it now. Yes, please. Okay, so please give us, give WebEx some time, a few seconds to, uh, to Ten more results. seconds. 10 more seconds according to Gwen. So for those who are watching us on Facebook, uh, you are very much welcome to um, join in the conversation. Just uh, type your uh, question in, in the uh, comment section of Facebook. So we now have the result. Okay, so the correct answer is 4%. So 18 got it right. Okay, only 18. Uh, and uh, uh, we will pick two winners for, uh, from those who answered our poll correctly. And each of them will get a PIDS notebook. And I will announce the winners before we close the open forum. I got a, a private message asking, why is it 4%? It is really 4%. You can check the... The presentation of Dr. Ulip, the 8% uh, pertains to the, um, the expenditure of other ASEAN countries. No? So he said that in contrast, ASEAN countries spend about 8% of total health uh, spending on uh, primary health care, whereas for the Philippines, it's only 4%. Okay, thank you very much. Now let us proceed to the Q&A. So... Uh, at this point, I now in, I invite our um, our uh, speakers, our two presenters, as well as our discussants, to answer some questions from our from the audience. And let me start with a question from okay, plenty of questions here, but uh, okay, several questions from uh, Mr. Vicente Camilo. Let me pick. A few questions from our participant, uh, Mr. Vicente Camilon. Are four piece beneficiaries fully compliant with health conditionalities, including vaccination? As we all know, um, under the four piece, um, child complete immunization following the DOH vaccination schedule is one of the conditionalities. And Val, you may want to answer this, but uh, we have. If you recall, we had uh, our third impact evaluation study of the four piece conducted by PIDS, and we even had a webinar on this. And according to the results of that uh, study, um, consistent with uh, previous findings uh, or previous evaluations, the four piece uh, does not result in increased uh, proportion of children who received complete immunization, complete immunization, although as we have seen in the Pro in the uh, presentation of uh, Jana, this is something that we can, I mean, something that we can blame the four P's. Uh, Jana herself told us about the supply side issues or supply side constraints. Jana, would you have something to say? Hi, yes. Um, so thank you for the question. Um, so the study is more a national assessment, but based on um, assessment from other fellows, so there is a problem with meeting the health conditionalities because the primary healthcare facilities may not have the necessary supplies. So if for some reason there is no vaccine to stock out, um, it can mm -hmm. exactly be blamed on the family that they were not able to get um, the service. So also from some anecdotes from people we have talked to in the SWD in passing, um, they say they're in a sense they're representatives at the LGU level um, will not will hold the, the, the transfer because it's not the fault of the family. So that still needs for their validation. And I think um, the four piece group in bids is moving towards that direction to check why they are not meeting the conditionalities. Hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Shana. 
perhaps we can get the view of uh, Dr. Tijano, uh, his, his, since he is involved in the National Immunization Program. So Dr. Tijano, that's the that finding in the P, uh, PIDS Third Impact Evaluation Program and in previous evaluations. So may problema tayo sa immunization coverage, immunization uh, rate ng mga 40s children. So nakita rin, of course, uh, perhaps you can, you can uh, comment on this from uh, the DOH side. Yeah, it's actually been the struggle of DOH to uh, uh, reach uh, that the uh, 95% target of the National Immunization Program. So one of the findings in the study of China and uh, Dr. Val is that the uh, supply side or the vaccine stock stock out. So what um, we are currently trying to address these issues, especially one of the main bottlenecks is really the delivery of the vaccines at the regional level down to the municipality level. Some uh, regions and some LGUs are are not able to pick up or deliver their vaccines at the R, at the RHU level. So uh, we are currently exploring what ways uh, or and in the app and initiatives we can do as an, as the national uh, agency to provide assistance to the LGUs on this. But definitely we're going to uh, take a closer look into this and to take action so that the delivery of the vaccines at the lowest level would be possible. Thank you very much, Dr. Tihan. If I may uh, um, mention, if I may ask a really uh, a question related to the COVID vaccines, it is. It, I mean, you mentioned that you know those supply side uh, bottlenecks, no, affecting the immunization natin for the children. So, yung, yung mga yung mga common vaccines natin sa, sa children. But uh, are we experiencing the same? Uh, problem logistics wise uh, ano pa ba yung uh, uh, difficulty yung maintaining or or yung sa stocking no yung sa covid kasi halos vaccine din naman yan eh di ba uh, yes thank you ma'am for that question currently i'm not holding the covid-19 vaccine uh, but i think all any health service that is uh, may be facing the same problem, no? but I'm, uh, again, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm the right person to ask the to answer that question. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, let let's move. Major controversial ata pang pinag-usapan natin yung COVID, no? So okay, let's move to another. Unless uh, some of your colleagues can can probably interject and uh, get uh, we get some response from them sa chat box and I'd be uh, more than happy to to uh, uh, read those uh, response responses. Okay, let us now move to um, another question and this one is from okay uh huh from this okay uh, perhaps I can address this to Miss De Leon no how can uh, and this is from Maria Lourdes Mendoza. How can PhilHealth help so that the poor can have a relationship with the health primary care facility? Uh, perhaps I think what she wants to know is how can. Okay. Uh, Ms. De Leon, perhaps you can mention about uh, PhilHealth's indigenous program. We're in. We are through the indigenous program. PhilHealth is helping to reach out to poor and marginalized sectors. Ah, okay, okay, ma'am. So right now, um, previously the primary care benefit uh, caters to selected uh, membership categories. PhilHealth, including uh, sponsored members and indigents. So, however, with the consulta package. We is not only to selected uh, membership categories, but for every Filipino, for every Filipino now. And consulta is uh, primarily a uh, patient choice, patient choice. So, for example, if let's say uh, there is a indigent member, or let we say, uh, let me say, meron po tayong kababayan na. Gusto pong magpa-consulta. So, 
uh, currently the registration is done in our local health insurance office of PhilHealth. So, kailangan lang po nilang pumunta sa aming uh, LIOS and magparegister to their consulta provider of choice. And for additional information lang po, the consulta benefit package of PhilHealth is pilot is in its pilot implementation for the first semester of the year. So until uh, currently po, there are consulta providers uh, in the country um, around uh, 50 plus po, 50 selected sites. So what you're saying, Ms. De Leon, is the uh, consulta package is open to everyone as long as you are enrolled in Bill Health. Yes, ma'am. Exactly. Um, exactly. Uh, the member should have a PIN or what we call Phil Health individual, Phil Health individual number. So, kailangan po. Uh, she is or the beneficiary is registered first to Phil Health. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Miss De Leon, uh, now that we have uh. Uh, I have a related question. Now that we have um, started the PILSIS, PILSIS registration, ah, yes, still health, looking mm -hmm. at this ID system as a way to improve uh, uh, regi uh, PIL health registration, we have more members uh, registered in PIL health. Um, Improving coverage, uh, uh, Ma'am, I think uh, that that issue is more appropriate addressed by another department. Okay. Opo, uh, the member management group. Po. So, but for the consulta program po, uh, we are using the field health number or PIN. But yes, I'm also aware, ma'am, that we are going to roll out the national ID system this coming or tomorrow. I think the, in the implementation or the start of uh, registration. But right now, ma'am, uh, in our office, we still use the PIN, perhaps for in the future. We will consider also the national ID. Thank you very much, uh, yes. Ms. De Leon. Okay, let's now uh, proceed to a, another. We have a question here, which is related to uh, improving our primary health care system, uh, possibly with a substantial increase in the budget of our local government units. Uh, mm -hmm. Once the Mandanas ruling has, uh, has been implemented, this question is from Vicente Camilon to all to, to all our panelists. So uh, Val, uh, maybe I may I hear from you on uh, your thoughts about this because you mentioned in your presentation that per capita spending on health varies across LGUs. So uh, how do you foresee this? Uh, you know, increase. Uh, resources for our LGUs, do you foresee any improvement when it comes to uh, 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 increased health spending or a better primary health care system perhaps in our LGUs, which also leads me to another related question from Maria Lourdes Mendoza. Um, when the Mandanas ruling will be in force, uh, how do we urge the LGUs to place health, um, the health of the, their constituents in their priority list? Val? Um, that's a, thank you, Ma'am Sheila. Thank you for that question. I think that's a very, very important um, situation that we are actually anticipating now. But I think what the, the way I see this is that we expect that the government, local government, will spend more on health, but it doesn't guarantee that. Right? So it's there, there is a there are different mechanisms for the local government or the national government that somehow forces this local government to spend more on health. Right? It can be 
through earmarking, for example, but the, these things need to be actually studied because there, there are possible repercussions of actions like this. Another thing is that for the national government to actually provide incentives for local mm -hmm. government, both financial and non-financial incentives to actually um, give, uh, I mean, for, for local governments to, to spend more on health, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there are different mechanisms in allowing, I mean, in, in giving incentives, both financial and non-financial mechanisms. Um, and 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 lastly, I think um, I think it's important for the national government to start giving the accountability to local governments. Um, the way we see now is that when there is a failure in health service delivery, it always blamed to the national government, which is actually a natural uh, reaction, right? But I think it's now time to provide that to give that accountability to local governments, right? And that is through better monitoring and evaluation. Um, and that's because that's the only way to me, um, I mean, that's the way to give accountability, right? Now it's that we don't have that mechanism, like right? it's, it's all channeled at the national level, but in reality, that's not how it should be. Like we need to give the local governments uh, the accountability and you need the platform to, 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 to say that, right? To tell the people that the local government is actually accountable for, for failure in the delivery of health systems and et cetera. And that's how, and that's the reality of it. Thank you very much, Val. So, okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, another question from Vicente Camilon. Will the passage of UHC law improve the primary care system? Mr. Camilon, this has been uh, mentioned by uh, Dr. Uy. In, uh, Dr. A covered this, uh, the UHC UHC law in her comments, and she mentioned strengthening the primary care system. But uh, Dr. Oi, would you like to um, um, add more to that? Yes, actually, I was also going to comment on that earlier uh, question. Go ahead, actually, ma Yeah, there would be an increase of funds to the LGUs because with the implementation of the universal health care, uh, there will be establishment of province-wide and city-wide health systems who shall pull and manage through a special health fund all resources special intended health for health services, which mm -hmm. will finance population-based and individual-based health services, health system operating costs, capital investments, remuneration of additional health workers, and incentives for all health workers. Right now, we need to advance the implementation of UHC. The Department of Health is putting in policies as well as instrumentalities for the implementation of the UHC. So we had a series of uh, uh, policies that were released. One was the one I mentioned on individual and population-based services, guidelines on the integration of local health systems into province-wide and city-wide health system, as well as uh, primary care policy framework and sectoral strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I uh, remind our uh, speakers to please turn on your, your video so that our uh, uh, participants can see you as you uh, um, answer the questions. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Oi mentioned about, you know, uh, full implementation of the UHC. However, I have a question here from Cecilia Akuin, and she's asking that given the current need uh, for PhilHealth resources to fund the COVID response, will it be possible for PhilHealth to implement UHC and meet the current resource implications of the the resource implications uh, presented by the two studies. Uh, perhaps you can comment on this, uh, Ms. Uh, De Leon. Ms. De Leon, we cannot hear you. I sorry, sorry. Hello. Yes, uh, we can hear okay. you now. Okay, loud and clear. So. Yes. We all know that the premium increase of field health has been suspended 
temporarily. Is it it? So the increase in premium. So naturally, some of our programs will be affected also. That's uh, it is uh, as stated in the UHC law, the implementation of comprehensive outpatient benefit package should be two years from the implementation of the law. So ideally, so 2019, so 20, so at least two years. So this year, we hope to implement the COPB, but due to unforeseen circumstances, so we have to delay the implementation of some of our programs. I see. Oh, that's, uh, hmm. that's but, sad but to hear. we will still implement. We'll still implement. So uh, we have uh, benefit plans uh, for the coming years. But yun po. Kumbaga, uh, hindi lang po sabay-sabay. Yun po. But we all have uh, take into account all the benefits that needs to be implemented. So yun po. Kasama naman po lahat. May benefit plan naman po. Ang feeling. Ma'am, 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 si Val. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead, Val. Ma'am, I think we need to understand. Thank you for that, ma'am, 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 But I think I just want to reinforce again that uh, public uh, like fiscal space is actually important, right? Like we need to invest more in health, etc. But I yes. think what we need to think about is like the active per like like active purchasing, right? So we need to make sure na saan natin ilalagay yung pera? Is it really in VOH or PhilHealth? Which one is actually more efficient way of doing it? And I think mm. those are the things that we need to think about. It's not only, you know, providing more resources. Five, but yes. In the past 10 years, we've actually get more resources, although we still need more. But I think what we need is to find that efficiency level. Okay, I think it's actually more efficient if you put more the resources here in mother so i think uh, we need to think more of that instead of like giving it for example to duh and allowing them to procure ncd drugs and commodities etc that they cannot mm -hmm. actually deliver so we need to find a mechanism that you know the way and how we actually provide these services in a more efficient way so i think we need to actually put that in our heads okay there is a that kind of aspect that we need to think about okay uh as i have mentioned Sean po, in my reaction earlier, uh, there have been talks between PhilHealth and the DOH regarding transitioning of commodities. So, ongoing naman po yan. So, and kasi po bali, uh, the programs ng PhilHealth, ang reference po talaga namin ay Department of Health. Po. So, Siyempre po, kung ano po yung mga programs or yun po, yun din po yung aming ilalabas. Okay. Sheila, could you okay. add something to that? Thank you, ma'am. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. Dr. Uy. Yeah. Oo, yeah. Actually, talagang uh, agree with ma'am De Leon. Right now, we're undergoing transitioning of commodities. Actually, uh, for NCD, all the commodities will be devolved to the LGU by next year. This mm -hmm. is in the what call Mandana's ruling. Mandana's. For the Mandana's ruling. What will be left for the DO is to procure our uh, insulin forms and needles. Oh. But by 2023, this will also be devolved to the LGUs. So actually, there's from the AO, all the population based services will be financed by the national government in support to the LGU during the transition. However, mm -hmm. uh, after two to three years, it will be the, uh, in the mandate of the LGU. LGU While the individual-based yeah. services will be financed by PhilHealth. Yeah. PhilHealth, just, yeah. Oo, malaki talaga yung implication ng, ano, ng uh, implementation ng Mandana's ruling. Uh, Val, Jana, Perhaps you can do a study on this with Justina, no? <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
Okay. Uh, let's now move to another question, and this is from Marvinson Fajardo. And Dr. Kim Fajardo, uh, I think this is for you. Um, sabi niya, um, okay, from her experience as a community doctor in Boho, the vac vaccination targets were set using grossly overestimated PSA population calculations. For example, the targets set to us, was around 50 to 70 percent more than the actual number of births in per barangay, thus reflecting low vaccination rates in our municipality. So have you explored the idea of recalculating the vac vaccination rates using actual number of births in a given area? Yeah, um, yes, thank you, Ma'am Sheila, for that question. So basically, it's actually one of the findings in the study of, um, uh, of Dr. Val and Ms. China Uina that the, at the national level, the, the even the procurement of the vaccine and even the targeting for the coverage uses the uh, projected uh, population of the Philippine Statistics Authority. So currently, we are exploring also that um, that method of enlisting the the, uh, the actual number of uh, of new births or new boards. But yeah, it entails um, again uh, a it, it entails uh, a work or a collaboration with the local unit because at the national level it would be very difficult for us to go down at the local level so it's a collaborative work between the local and the national level so that we would be able to identify the actual number of births in the in each uh, community but yeah we are exploring that in in procuring in forecasting in, in planning and in, as well as in the competing for the coverage of the uh the Thank you, uh, Dr. Tijano. Uh, if I may keep you, keep, keep you there, no, because we have a question here, a related question, also on, uh, on vaccination from Maria Lourdes Mendoza. Uh, how are you uh, addressing the problem of delivering vaccines uh, in, in conflict areas? Can you share what the DOH is doing to reach the conflict areas? Um, perhaps I could share what we did in the MROPVC yeah, that was recently conducted. So we that we asked help from other national government agencies such as the Philippine Coast Guard, AFP, PNP, so that the vaccines can be delivered in this conflict area. So um, we are still to explore other methods or other ways so that these vaccines can be uh, delivered to the, to such uh, areas. But for over the past years, that's what we have been doing. And also, it's actually the LGUs and the, our LGUs getting the vaccines at the regional storage facility. In cases where in the regions won't be able to deliver these vaccines to those areas. Thank you very much, Kim. Another question for you. Ngayon lang dumarating yung mga uh, questions natin, ano? But this one is from uh, uh, Mrs. Cecilia Francisco. Uh, national, if I may read it, uh, national immunization campaigns are great catch up interventions. Noting that timeliness is crucial, one time national campaigns may not be the solution. Is there an analysis to compare the cost of national campaigns versus cost of strengthening soft components that strengthen local capacity on promoting, targeting, monitoring, and related immunization services? still at the primary healthcare level. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Basically, even I don't believe that uh, the supplemental immunization activity is the solution. We are conducting this because there are outbreaks, so it's an outbreak response. But definitely, uh, currently I'm not an, I'm not aware of any study on the on, uh, on comparing the cost of national campaign versus cost of strengthening sub components, but what we are currently doing is, and even recommended by the study of uh, Dr. Val and Ms. China, is that um, investing more on the non-vaccine commodities of the program because for the uh, since uh, over the past years the, the investment is uh, the bulk of the investment is really on the vaccine itself, but there is only a few investment on the H on HRH on info system for the vaccine uh, supply chain. So yeah, um, the national musician program will be ex 
um, exploring uh, ways to further invest on the soft components of the program. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tijano. We are down to our last question because we only have a few minutes left. So this will be our last question. Um, and this one is from Michael De Leon. Very interesting question. How can different stakeholders aid LGUs in maximizing the use of information and communications technology or e-health for better implementation and management as prescribed by the universal health care? I would like to hear from all uh, the um, speakers on this, our presenters and our uh, discussants as the final remarks. Um, I should go first, uh, this is Val. Yes, please, yes. I, I'm, okay. I'm a believer of incentives. Uh, I'm not a believer of, of you know, mandating things like this. And I think that's why I believe in the power of purchasing power. So if you use feel health mechanisms to provide incentives and, you know, mandate, you know, uh, local governments or health facilities to submit this one, I think that will be actually a good start. So yes. in short, we use incentives and feel health to harness and integrate health facilities and health information system. So I think that's that's my my um, my uh, thoughts on this. But others might have a different idea. Thank you very much, uh, Val, for your uh, insights and uh, great presentation today. How about you, Jana? May we hear your thoughts on how the uh, different stakeholders in LGUs, okay, uh, how different stakeholders can aid or um, motivate LGUs to maximize the use of ICT uh, or e-health for better implementation and management as uh, prescribed um, in the universal health care. All right. So as a researcher, as an, an and perhaps you can turn on your video. Hindi namin kayo makita. All right. Po. Sige po. So as a researcher and a lover of data, um, Parang the power of data kasi is uh, really you convince people to generate the data when you can show that it's useful. So in my four or five years of experience as a researcher, um, the LUs actually collect and use a lot of the electronic information systems as mentioned by Dr. Uwe, um and other experts in the health. But, but the problem is, is they don't understand what they are collecting um, and they are not, parang they don't benefit much for it. From it, so DOH, FIHIS, I can access. I hope there are a lot, like ten more, ten or more systems. But what is really going back to the LGUs? Um, so up till today, they don't understand things past how many cases they have of a certain disease, and not even for their whole LGU. It's mostly the public sector data that they themselves report. So I, for me, I believe it's more. So we have a lot of data now. How do we? assess its quality, how do we use it, how do we give back to the LGUs and say your investments in collecting, in putting HR to do it, uh, or your maybe pay in investment in the computers or internet, because those are expensive things, right? So why would you invest in something you don't benefit from? And it's more of a requirement um, for reporting. So that's my take on it. Um, uh, ensure they are able to really benefit from the data and their investment, not just a reporting requirement. Salamat, Jana, and thank you very much for your presentation today. Dr. Uh, Maria uh, Rosario Una, any thoughts on how we can harness the use of uh, ICT in um, perhaps uh, improving our health, uh, primary health care system, ma'am? I agree with Doc Val. We need incentives in order to encourage our LGUs. Actually, it's also a lack of knowledge and the info system. Our eye clinics is, is free. Out of the 2,500 issues, around 500 use Friday EMRs. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to orient and more uh, advocacy, promotion, and the use of the data. And I agree with Ms. Jana, we have to translate the data into something good. How can we put it to good use? And we have to strengthen the interconnectivity of the eye clinics with the field health so that people will understand that they can reimburse their claims only if they submit data. And what's the use of the data to them? Uh, what's the significance? So more of really promotion, health education. Thank you. We are Thank happy you. to help, ma'am, the analysis. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, let us move to uh, uh, the response of uh, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim Tejano. Dr. Tejano? Yes, thank you, ma'am. So basically, I think the uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 situation has strengthened the, or perhaps advocated the use of in, uh, info system, especially at the LGU level, because um, almost all LGUs are using this info system for them to cater to other patients than COVID, and to, as well as to gather data and to analyze this data. So I guess it's really important that we invest in um, in the info system so that it, and for the local levels to be able to invest the invest also in such system because it will be very uh, critical in the uh, in the monitoring and evaluation of the different uh, programs on health. Thank you very much, Dr. Tijano. And Ms. Uh, Ana De Leon of uh, PhilHealth, ma'am? So De Leon? I, yes. I also agree with Dr. Dr. Uy that indeed uh, ICT is very important and as we move to the healthcare provider network as envisioned in the law, it is really critical and we also need the assistance from LGUs to really uh, establish uh, a competent or reliable internet connectivity among its facilities and also with field health uh, we now uh, mandatory to submit claims electronically so i think that's one way of pushing our facilities to really invest in ict not only facilities but also to inform our lgus our partners that there's there's no other way to go but to invest in e-health. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, marami pong uh, salamat sa ating mga speakers. And uh, with that, friends, please join me in thanking our presenters, Dr. Val Ulep and Ms. Chana Uy, and our discussants, uh, Dr. Rosario Uy and Dr. Kim uh, Tejano of UOH, and Ms. Ana Liza De Leon, uh, for the valuable information and insights that uh, they shared with us this afternoon, let us all give them a big virtual clap. And thanks to all our participants who, particip uh, who uh, join us in the open forum. Friends, as we continue to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic, it is important that we do not lose sight of other health issues confronting the country, such as our low vaccination coverage and the untimely immunization of children as well as the rising cases of non-communicable uh, diseases or NCDs in the country. We hope that our conversation today has helped everyone understand the issues and what needs to be done uh, to attain herd immunity from vaccine-preventable uh, diseases, as well as address the burden and threat of NCDs. Okay. So uh, before we close, I'd like to announce the, uh, the winners of our poll for this week. Our winners are Maria Lourdes Ursos and um, uh, Vic Victoriva Luc uh, Tancinco. Uh, Maria Lourdes Ursos and Victori Victoriva Luc Tancinco. Uh, you won in our poll uh, for today, so our our webinar team will get in touch with you for your for the for the delivery of your prize. Okay, so here are. Before we finally close, uh, we have some reminders. So you can download all um, the presentations from the PIDS website, as well as the links to the full studies. Okay, and uh, please help us improve our website by answering our survey. So flash on the screen is the link. And we all look forward to your comments on how we can improve our virtual events. And of course, uh, please continue to visit our website for um, updates on our upcoming events as well as, well as uh, all our knowledge resources and follow us on our social media pages. Maraming salamat sa lahat ng tumutok sa atin sa Facebook. Okay, and for our webinars in May, we have three. We have on May 13, uh, 
will examine uh, our reg regulatory policies and solid waste management on May 20. We'll uh, resume our conversation on the digital economy. We'll uh, talk about its costs, benefits, and taxation of digital economy in the Philippines. And on May 27, we will have our webinar on gender issues in platform work and ICT use in the Philippines. Okay. And finally, we would like to thank all uh, the representatives from the different sectors, from government, from um, uh, the private sector, uh, from uh, civil society, from the academe, from uh, international, organization, international organizations, and of course, from the media for uh, joining us in our webinar today. So friends, this concludes our virtual event for this week. So uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Maraming salamat po.